Welcome to Modern Aikido's podcast. I'm doing a live interview today with a friend of mine, Oliver Martinez Sensei. Uh, he's from Dal the Dallas Fort Worth area. He's got a dojo down there and he teaches Aikido and karate together. And I wanted to bring him on to talk about two different topics. Uh, the first one being how he's used different influences uh, from different arts together with his Aikido seamlessly and not let uh, his Aikido be uh, uh, corrupted or diluted because it has these other influences. In fact, it's strengthened it. And he's a perfect example. It's been many years, too many years, my friend, until since we've been on the mat together. Sure. Uh, but he's always been a great example to me of somebody that brings those arts together and they don't feel like a hodgepodge. They are, they are integrated. Um, the second topic I wanted to talk with Oliver about is uh, Bill Sosa Shihan, who was from our, both of our shared lineage in Aikido together. And uh, I wanted to know more about him. He's, he's a, I found he's a rather famous character in the Aikido world, very highly respected, but not much is known about him widespread. He's not uh, your um, uh, Seagal caliber celebrity status type instructor, uh, but very much had, had a uh, tremendous character and tremendous Aikido from what I've heard. So um, before we get started, I just want to say we're doing this on Zoom. And if there's a cut because of the limit of the amount of time you can do on a, on a Zoom call for, for this discussion, if it goes long, I'm gonna cut the two segments together and then present them as one long video. So if you see a rough cut in there, that's, that's what happened. So uh, with that, I mean, here's uh, Sensei Oliver Martinez. I'm gonna let him kind of give an intro uh, to himself and we'll, we'll cover the Bill Sosa Shihan topic first, I think uh, would be a good way to start. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be on your first Zoom version of this. This is, this is really cool. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, I started training with Sosa Sensei when I was 10 in 1992. And I trained with him until he passed away until 2002. So for that period of time, I was seeing him maybe three, four times a week um, for that 10-year 10, 10 period of time. And uh, that was pretty much my exposure to martial arts during that time. I had done Taekwondo previously, uh, because if you grow up in Texas, in the 80s, 90s, you're doing Taekwondo. Like, it's probably not even that different today, but you are absolutely gonna be doing Taekwondo. Uh, my dad had studied a little bit of Aikido uh, in the Air Force. He was a MP in the Air Force, and they had brought an Aikido guy in to, I, I believe he said they taught him to do a little bit of a kemi, like some forward rolls, back rolls, and then a couple of joint locks. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, I got to about 10, we were looking for something that we could do together. And he's like, you know, this Aikido thing, you might be interested in that. And so uh, we, we found Sosa Sensei in, in Dallas. We live in a suburb about 20 minutes out. And uh, there was no kids program at the time, but Sensei said, you can try one class. If you, if you do okay, then you can continue to train. Cause my dad and I wanted to do it together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I That's guess- That's the best was, training situation for a, adult and the child. That's fa fantastic. I, if you're not doing it, I highly recommend it. My, uh, my four year old son has just started this past month and uh, I'm starting to get just a taste of what my dad must have felt like, like doing it. Um, it. It was a phenomenal time for us to bond, just the drive over there, the training, the drive back, kind of talking about class. So if you're not training with your family, rope somebody in. It's, it's, it's really healthy for family structure. Absolutely. But uh, we started then in 1992 and uh, just continued to train with Sensei until he passed away. Um, and then I trained in some other Aikido systems in college after that, uh, Awama mainly. And then I flirted with it. I wasn't like a hardcore Awama guy. I love Awama. I love my exposure to it, but I'm not claiming that I, I have a great understanding of it. And then I just over the years, and we can talk about it a little bit more, I've gotten exposed to karate, um, uh, practical karate under Ian Abernathy, uh, and then Ji uh, Kune Do in the Filipino martial arts under Guru Dan and Asanto. So at our academy, we teach all three of those of those systems. Mm -hmm. But um, I know you want to talk about Sensei first. So where do you want to where do you want to hop into? Well, yeah, the uh, and I've got a great story. Uh, most of what I've I've learned from about Sosa Sensei came from the instructors in our, in our lineage, but I have gotten some, some insights from outside uh, from people that recognize it. And when this happened at a seminar, it surprised me. Uh, and I'll just tell the story when I was at a seminar years ago and it was not within our organization. This was a 
I, uh, you know, and I can't remember if it was an Ike Kai seminar. We got to working on Sankyo. And, and uh, usually the finish that we would do, uh, as you'd get into Sankyo, you'd, you'd kind of lift your center a little bit, you'd rise Uke up and just cut straight down. And I didn't know any other finish than that. I'd never seen the, the, what, the what is usually the typical Ike Kai finish where you step around the other side of the arm to the elbow and you cut down and then you step back around to get a standing pin or, or do something like that. And somebody saw me, and I think I was about brown belt level. So I was, I was doing that cut down, and somebody walks across the mat to come over. And I was like, oh, boy, what, a, what did I screw up? Because <laughs> this was, a, this was a, an instructor, black belt. And he said, you're one of Sosa's students, aren't you? And I said, I was a met, I've never met him, but I, I've come from his lineage. He's in my, in my, in a, in my Aikido lineage, yeah. And he says, I've never seen anybody other than Sosa students do that cut. Like that is typical. That is so typically Bill Sosa. You, I said, you must have been, I said, I spotted it right away. And it, it was one of the most pleasant surprises I've ever had at a seminar to have somebody spot Bill Sosa's, uh, his preference or his style within what I was doing. And, you know, everything I'd heard about him, he was the utmost gentleman. His, uh, well, what I've seen of him on video, his Aikido is very smooth, very powerful. Um, you know, I was very happy to learn from people that learned directly from him about what made his Aikido powerful. And one of the, one of the things I respected the most was his history of being a Golden Gloves boxer and bringing the attitude of this has to work against punches and aggressive uh, attacks, not just the stylized attacks that Aikido tends to modern Aikido tends to be absorbed with. So uh, maybe you could yes. fill in a little bit of Sosa's background with the punching. Be because, again, that was my only, remember this is pre-YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. if you wanted to see another Aikido person, you had to like send away for a VHS or, you know, eventually a DVD or something, but you did not have a lot of exposure to other Aikido people. So I just thought that what Sensei was teaching was Aikido. Mm -hmm. I had I had no idea that it would be any Aikido different. Aikido is Aikido is Aikido. Yeah. As, as how, how, how different could it be, right? <laughs> so let me give you a little bit of background on, on Sensei, and then we'll kind of talk about how that manifested on the map. So as a young man, he was a boxer, Golden Glove boxer. Mm -hmm. um, what I understand, he, he says to himself, I've never been knocked out. I have been knocked down. And so a lot of times you talk about, like, look, you will get knocked down. Like, that happens. That can happen. People are fast. People are strong. Mm -hmm. Um after boxing, he moved into Ishinru Karate. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how long he did it, uh, but I, I have heard him talk about his fighting experience there. So I know they were sparring. You know, it's, it's 70s karate sparring, you know, so it, it was hard, really, really hard. Uh, and then he did judo with Vince Tamura. Now, he always joked. He said, I, all of my nine months of judo. I think you can get a lot of judo in nine months, probably. Yeah, you can, yeah. Uh, so I know he always joked that he, he wasn't very well versed in judo. But uh, my suspicion is he was probably pretty good at it, if I had to, to guess, based on these other things that I'd seen him do. Mm -hmm. So he had boxing, uh, karate, judo, and then he walks in the Chicago Aikikai and he falls in love with Aikido. Mm -hmm. And he says specifically, it was the mind-body coordination aspects that attracted him. It was the... It was, remember, the guy knew how to fight. He could box. He could kick. He could throw. So he saw something else in Aikido that was attractive to him. He saw that the Tohei's mind-body coordination. Now, I don't think he saw Tohei right away. Uh, it was um, the Seo Takahashi school. Mm -hmm. But from what I understand, Tohei Sensei would come in for like a month at a time or two weeks at a time. So they would have uh, good exposure to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sensei would said anytime he said who his teachers were, he'd always say, Seo Takahashi, Koichi Tohei. So it wasn't like the guy who came in once a, a year. Twice a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he had a, a good amount of exposure uh, to Tohei and his style. So in the early 70s, he's going to move to Dallas. And Seo Takahashi tells him, when you get to Texas, you need to open a dojo. Mm. Uh, Sensei says, yeah, sure. When I get down there, I'm sure amongst – uprooting my life and going over there. I'll have time to start a dojo. So he comes to Dallas and Seo Takahashi passes away. And he realizes he had given a dying man his word <laughs> that he would start an Aikido dojo in Texas. Mm -hmm. So so he does. He brings Aikido. Now, if he's the first Aikido teacher in Texas, I do not know. 
but he definitely would have been an early pioneer mm -hmm. in the area. Um, so Dojo opens up in Dallas. I come in in the early 90s. So he's already been very well established and been there for a while. Mm -hmm. Here are some of the things that we did on a, on a monthly, weekly basis that I had no idea were different than other Aikido schools. We learned how to counter jabs and crosses. Mm -hmm. We learned how to bob and weave under hook punches. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned how to counter kicking. Uh, he reserved that for the advanced class, but it was in the curriculum, in the mm -hmm. syllabus, is uh, how to counter a kick. Um, he, we did choking extensively. We did a lot of choking. I had no idea chokes were not common in Aikido. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit of story about that here in a second, too. Um, I used to think that Sensei was maybe 10 or 15 years ahead of his time. I'm starting to push that number up to 30. Because as I'm looking at YouTube now, I'm finding people come to solutions that he was doing already when I first showed up mm -hmm. and even earlier. Uh, so he has three books he published. He's got uh, Essence of Aikido in 1987. Um, he self-published a manual called Police Aikido Controlling Tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a copy of it right here. There's only 500 of these. I've got, so there's 499 floating around out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, this book would later be expanded into uh, Secrets of Police Aikido, mm -hmm. which he hated that title. He hated that title. He said there were no such thing as secrets. There's just stuff you don't know yet. But his publisher said, no, no, no. You got to call it Secrets of Police Aikido. Got to put some gl uh, glitz on. You gotta yeah, absolutely. Sex. He hated it, but he did it. Um, it was essentially the same book. It was a little bit expanded with some Aiki Taisos and warm-ups and stuff like that. Uh, and then he has this book here. Um, Aikido, uh, Aikido Journey to Self Mastery. It's more of like a memoir than a, than a technical book. Yeah. That's a great book for perspective. Uh, a lot, I think, as people get into it, and I, I certainly did this when I started, as I, I couldn't get enough Aikido content. I was wanting, I was ordering books, I was getting mm -hmm. them on Daito Ru Aikido Jiu Jitsu, you name it. I was getting, I just wanted everything, fill the brain, you know, just as much. But books like that are not the ones that are not technical and the, that are more perspective based for the mind are the ones that I found the most that were the meatiest. Like I could see pictures of techniques and, and that was initially f fulfilling. It's kind of like potato chips. You, you like them, but they you can't make a meal out of them. <laughs> right. Book like that is one of those you can make a meal out of like, as you start to see it and understand what he's talking about. Uh, so yeah, you return to the, I have to be honest with you. Uh, you know, when this book came out, I'm not even sure when this, it, well, I'll tell you, it was published uh, after he passed away. He'd been working on it before, but it was published after he passed away. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, oh, man, we're not going to see any more technique. You know, we're not going to see any more of his stuff. Um, and a lot of that was because, you know, we had just lost him. And so the idea of not having any more of Sensei's teaching, I mean, it's, it's kind of rough. You know, I was, you know, 20 or something like that. Uh, but now I can look back and realize what a treasure it is that mm -hmm. we have it. That being said, his 1987 book, Essence of Aikido, is his most uh, simple. It's just technique. Brief history, how to fold your hakama, that kind of thing. But there's some sections in there that I realize now are super important um, that I didn't think about. There's kick countering in that book in 1987. Mm -hmm. And I have yet to see a book published before then that covered that. Now, I could be mistaken. And I always tell people, if you find one earlier, let show me, please let me know it, who else is doing this at the time, yeah. but I've yet to see it. Uh, he was doing things like back fists. Cause remember this is 1987. So mm -hmm. it's karate, right? Kickboxing, a lot of back fists, spinning back fists. Um, mm -hmm. The kick curriculum, we're dealing with things like how to do, uh, how to counter double round kicks, kick to the body, kick to the head, sure. turn back kicks. Um, again, things that you would expect to see out of a kickboxer or a karate guy, Taekwondo practitioner at that time. Early in the 90s, he brought in a guy to teach us. He just called it ground techniques. I had no idea what this was. 20 years later, as I'm recalling, like, it was Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So he's, teach, he's brought a guy in to teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like in 93, 94, like he could see the writing on the wall. That this stuff is going to be important. You, you have to incorporate all of this. Uh, we were doing ground escapes when I first showed up. And in fact, again, 1987, I don't know if it was in his first book, but by police uh, keto controlling tactics, he's showing uh, ground escapes, which is basically BJJ, BJJ Oompa, you know, basically like a, a bridge and, and clear. And mm -hmm. 
it, it's not, it wasn't as sophisticated as what, what we know now, but you could already see the wheels turning. Like we, we have to have all this stuff. We need to know. Uh, we were learning how to deal with jabs and crosses, slipping punches. We would uh, bob and weave before we would get the back. So all that stuff was, was just in the curriculum. And I had no idea that other people weren't doing it. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it rings a bell for me for the what's the important part. And I think uh, when you describe that as being a lot of times people are like, okay, I just need a technique against the jab. I need a technique against the kick. That's the finger that's pointing at the moon. It's not yeah. the moon. The moon is the attitude of we have to be, I have to be able to deal with this. And I have mm -hmm. to not just have done it once five years ago, but I included in my practice routine. I train this on a regular basis. I've done it enough so that I'm comfortable with it. I, I know it like the back of my hand, like that's what technique really is. It's not collecting the, the secret technique that's gonna, gonna be the counter that you need, like you're carrying around a, a pack of cards and you have the card to play. It's the, it's the mindset attitude of I can deal with this. I can deal with, with uh, any, any kind of a thing I, I will likely be faced with. So uh, I think as people, especially Aikidoists that, that are looking to branch out, don't go uh, technique collecting as much as get the right attitude set in your head. You were pointing out something that I think Sensei did in a way that I've yet to see very many other people do. May, uh, like a Bruce Bookman currently, I can see him doing things like this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's others out there currently who do this. But mm -hmm. Sensei was a master at finding solutions outside of Aikido mm -hmm. and retrofitting them so they fit Aikido. So it wasn't just like you're doing boxing and then all of a sudden you, you do Aikido. Like there you're stapling was, something else on. It was not just stapling, uh, right. uh, you know, or putting a post-it note and going like, that should cover it. That should solve it. There was a integration between the concept and then what he was already doing. So I've got, I've got an example of that. We did a lot of rear naked chokes uh, mm -hmm. coming up often. I mean, this was not like a once in a, a, a blue moon thing. We were doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Again, I just thought that was Aikido. You know, I just thought that's what we we're supposed to do. You know, every, every Aikido guy has chokes. Um, they do now, but, but not at the time. Right. So about two or three years ago, I needed a new phone. So I'm in a phone store, AT&T. And actually, there's an older gentleman talking to the, uh, to the attendant. And you have that martial arts radar where I'm like, they're talking about martial arts. Like, I can't even tell what they're talking about, but there's just those words, you know, popping up. I love it. The martial arts radar. That's yeah, funny. you know, you're just like, they're, they're talking about something. So the attendant goes and, and the older gentleman's just kind of sitting there. And, Sir, I'm sorry to bother you. Like, I know you're, I know you're trying to get a phone, but did I hear you talking about judo over there? He's like, oh yeah. Oh, I was talking about judo, you know, and, and like all of us. Oh, he lifts, lights up. Arts? Yep. Let's do it, man. And so uh, while he's waiting on his phone, we're talking about his background. He's, he's an old school judo guy, like real classical. And he studied under Vince Tamura, who was my, just coincidentally, um, was my sensei's judo coach in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, Vince Tamura and his brother moved to Dallas, again, coincidentally, about the same time sensei did. And so we're talking about all this stuff. And he goes, you know what Vince was really good at? Oh, I don't know. I don't know anything at him except for the, the sensei trained with him. He said he was a choke specialist. Mm -hmm. He's like, his throws were good. His sweeps were good. He was a choke specialist. He told me the story about her, uh, Tamura Sensei. You know, they're they're grappling, and he goes in for what looks like a like a like an epon or something like that, some sort of modified epon. He takes the guy over, and when the guy hits the ground, he's unconscious. And everybody had thought that he he'd knocked him unconscious when he hit the ground. Tamura Sensei had begun the choke on the clinch, continued it on the way over, and put the guy out midair. Oh, blood choke <laughs> in mid throw. Wow. Blue, yeah, blood choke, mid, and, you know, this guy's like, that's how good Vince Tamura was. Hmm. So you take that, that ingredient. You have a judo instructor who's an expert at choking. You get Sensei, who has that exposure, and he seamlessly integrates it into what we're doing. So when you do a Riminage, instead of taking a person to the ground, seal it up, put, put a choke on it. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're throwing a gum netsky or, you know, you parry it, you do an arm triangle choke. Love right? that one. Love right? that one. Right, I do too, which is hilarious to me that you like that because you're eight feet tall. Like, it's got to be like the hardest like choke for you in the you world. You know, and here's, here's the one thing. Being, being six four, 
when I level change underneath it and I get in my, the top of my shoulder in somebody's armpit and I stand up, I take them. Oh, right yeah, I'm sure that's probably it. That's all. Sure. I just elevate them right off the ground. And Absolutely. That's yeah. like, that's the cherry on the, on the Sunday right there. Yeah. But you know, that's one of those things like the arm triangle. Yep. It's one of those things that you, you don't see widespread in Aikido. I think you're starting to. Yeah. Encounter. yeah. But then the funny thing is there's photographs of the O sensei, like in his fifties mm -hmm. on the ground with somebody in an arm triangle. So yes. like the stuff was always there. Yes. It got lost. And then it takes people to kind of like rediscover, it, you know. You no, know, it's funny. That's that's a great way to look at it. And I do recall hearing over the last probably ten years uh, when Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys crossed with wrestling guys, mm -hmm. and especially with like catch wrestlers and whatnot, they found out about leg locks. Yeah. And the BJJ guys hated those leg locks, and having been put in them, and I train them and teach them. They do suck. You do not want to get caught in a leg lock. That is a combination of pain and humiliation. Um, but, and this is what, where, where I relate this, is that initially there was a lot of resistance. Like the BJJ guys, like this ruins our stuff. We don't, we don't, mm -hmm. want, we don't want any part of this. They scorned it and they this looked down. Witchcraft you guys are trying to pull. Yeah, this, this voodoo stuff. <laughs> but then they realized, you know, there's some merit here. Let's, let's put our, our displeasure aside and let's learn about this. And to yeah. me, that is the positive attitude to have when exposed to something new, especially something that wrecks you. When you realize, yeah. wow, that's a great tool. And I'll tell you, for me, when I run across something like that, my eyes light up. I will run right over to him, like, show me this. I wanna, I wanna what dig my that? teeth into it. I, like, I, there's no disgust. Like, you've just made me look bad. It's no, yeah. you've just shown me a great new tool that I wanna, I wanna Absolutely. take out of the box and play with. And, and you know, again, that's one of those things that since it was so good at, he had ex he actually ran a martial arts supply store in Dallas. Oh, did so he? he? I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, he did. Uh, uh, right in Dallas, and uh, so he had exposure to all these guys coming in, all these different martial arts. So you you think that these martial artists aren't sitting around talking about martial arts, you know, and exchanging stuff? We're all a bunch of geeks. Yeah, we're just geeking out about this stuff, you know. Um, but to his credit, it's not like he would see something and then come into class and go like, check this guy, check this out. Right. He would sit on it. Oh yeah. Sometimes. And then all of a sudden you're doing something in your class. And you're like, what is this? But it just felt like it always should have been there. So a another example is he was uh, friends with uh, Guru Dan and Asanto. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that. First of all, I didn't know who Dan Asanto was when I was a young guy. I didn't know that they were friends. I, I only found this out much later. But we were doing things in our system uh, that were like the Filipino drill hubud, which is like a, a close quarter trapping drill. So we would, we call it double hand parry. You know, you parry something off and then you'd wedge in to maintain that line or you would, you would, you know, stick your arm up and then transition. And the way Sensei taught it was, well, you're going to use unbendable arm. And then you're going to use kind of a, a Udafuri movement to clear it. So he was able to take these Filipino martial arts movements, run them through the Aikido filter, and they're Aikido, like that. They're Aikido, you know. And uh, so he wasn't, he, was, he wasn't a geek like we are, where we would just look at something and go, like, check this out, guys. We got to do this. It was very thoughtful and methodical about how it could fit into our game. And you know, then, that's, that, I'm glad you'd really glad you described it that way because you've kind of described the way that when I was about brown belt, I got exposed to a really good – couple of mentors and instructors one with a really strong wrestling background another one with a very strong kick kickboxing muay thai and boxing background wow. and I, i'm like being a geek i wanted to learn everything I'm like you know yeah. give me I, I, especially because these were both law enforcement officers so they had a lot of real world experience yeah. uh that showed what it was like to deal with this stuff in live fire so i was fascinated and i started working with them and initially probably the first year i was like i don't see how this would fit into aikido at all but like Sosa, I percolated on it. Like, how different are the movements really? And I, as I started breaking them down, and this would have been 12 years ago I got to start on this, or some, somewhere in that range. But the more I did them, the more I realized the movements are not far off. They're very close. The idea of not using strength to match strength head on, absolutely fit. And you wouldn't normally think of that in boxing, wrestling, you know, the combatives style stuff but it's there it's there when you are when you when you can see it when you can remove your predisposition and yes. see what is actually there what it is is smart strategy you use your strength against a weakness 
You use movement to be able to do that. Every art has that. No art says be stupid and just annihilate. Yeah. They put all of your strength against other strength. Like, yeah, that's it's bad combative principle, right? Yeah, it's, that's it's, not an Aikido trademark <laughs> at all. I was uh, a few years back. I'm at a workshop. I, I was, I'm fortunate enough to get to train with Guru Dan and Asanto twice a year. Mm -hmm. uh, not this year, but, but normal right. years. I get to see him twice a year. Uh, and he's teaching some Muay Thai and he's working some kick catches, some, some Muay Thai round kick catches. And the one working on the setup for it is you, you, the kick's coming for the ribs, you loop your arm over and you, you right. hook it. And that opens the door to a bunch of different takeouts. You can sweep sure. your leg, you could strike, you could, you could lean into it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at that going like, oh my gosh, your ribs are going to be like jello. So I go up to him after, you know, after everyone disperses and they're working, I go, uh, you know, Guru, hey, how how do you avoid the injury of the ribs? And he goes, Oh, no problem. What you do is you, where the force is coming, you move in that same direction to dissipate. I was like, right. you mean you blend with, it? I was like, I felt so stupid, you know, <laughs> like I've only been doing this my entire life. But when you step outside of your playground, mm -hmm. you can't even see the, the similarities uh, right. of what's out initially. There. Yeah. Initially. initially. Yeah. It takes time. And so now I teach those kick counters in my Aikido class and no one even bats an eye because it looks exactly like if somebody was doing a yoga mm -hmm. and I did, and I blended in this direction, blend, yeah. someone throws a round kick to my ribs. I blend in that direction. It's identical. Mm -hmm. No one goes like, well, what is this? This doesn't feel like the other stuff that we do. Right. But you got to identify the, the combative principles at play. And then when you look at Aikido, you go like, we specialize in these combative principles. So there are things, you know, find those things that kind of sure. fit into that you know that's the most disappointing i think the thing that i think of when i hear well that's not aikido it's mm -hmm. slamming the door shut on the possibilities mm -hmm. and on the yeah. opportunities it's not saying there's there's something there maybe i can't see it mm -hmm. you know let me look it's just a, a lockout and so yeah. yeah yeah well which kind of brings us into our, our, our other topic of uh, that yeah. we, we talked about a little bit earlier about cross training mm -hmm. you know and um i do from an aikido perspective if you're an aikido like that's that's my first law Aikido's my first law mine too there yeah so there's um a tendency to go well i'm gonna go cross train again so that i can staple something onto my aikido mm -hmm. and and you can do that i'm not slamming that i think that that that, that is something you you can do i think you will enjoy the ride better if you go look at other arts and go like what do they have that Aikido's got, the, but, but maybe it's not being trained as well as it, as it could be. Um, but to do that, you really kind of have to understand combative principle, right? So like in Aikido, uh, Sosa Sensei uh, has, has said, I spent 90% of my Aikido career learning how to get behind somebody. Like that's what, well, tactically, that's what he was doing, right? How do I clear an arm? How do I uh, remove something so that I can get to a, a, an advantageous position? Well, you look at uh, like arm drag drills, like from wrestling, and I'm like, yeah. we need that. Oh, that I love arm drag in Aikido, right? They're one of because my favorite tools to, to bring into Aikido is the arm drag. Absolutely, and what you find is like they're already in Aikido. They're kind of there. So like if you think about like a Yoko Minuchi, mm -hmm. Shibunagi, for example, right? You 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 blend. I'm glad I'm a rolling chair. I can do this. You blend, you catch, and then you drag right. the yeah. arm from one side to the other. But you're doing it at a very particular range. When you look at a wrestling or jujitsu arm drag, you're just the my is compressed. But tactically, it's the same thing. You're on the inside. You need to control that limb. You need to move it to the other side of your body safely so that you have access to the back. Mm -hmm. And you go like, that's a no-brainer. Like, why aren't we doing that? You know, why don't we have that? Well, the answer is we. You can't just do it. <laughs> just go and do it. It's not that exactly. hard. You know. I think one of the, the ingredients, and, I, and I've seen, I know exactly what you're talking about with that lead. It's, called, it's often called a lead or a guide where mo a lot of modern Aikido instructors say the, uh, Uke provides all the, the direction through. You just guide that. Well, an arm drag, you could just say that's a little bit more assertive. Well, what mm -hmm. if Uke stops? Your arm drag is still going to take their arm through. And that, that to me is a, is, a, is a distinction, but it's a very important distinction of what happens when Uke changes their direction in mid flow. Well, of yeah. course, a lot of the choreographed Aikido tends to be, you know, you don't, you're a bad Uke if you change your direction or you stop or you reverse or you do something right. else. But a good arm drag, you, you got Uke's posture right yeah. away and you keep it. And that's, that's a great 
great aspect to it. You're bringing up a real, the, the bad UK thing, you're bringing up a really good point because I'm kind of torn on that. Mm-hmm. I'm not really torn. I've got, I've got an idea of it now, but, it, but early on I was like, man, like on the one hand, you're trying to learn something. And so mm-hmm. it's the easiest thing in the world for an UK to, mm-hmm. to prevent that learning process from happening. Yeah. But at the same time, um, we know that we need some type of resistance, live resistance to, to make it function. And unpredictability. And unpredictability. Uh, and I'll tell you who solved that for me yeah. uh, is a, a man named Ian Abernathy. Uh, I bet a lot of the people that listen to your show know it, uh, know him yes. already. Yeah. So Ian's got great different. stuff. But if you don't, uh, Ian Abernathy is one of the, my favorite people on the entire planet. He's a uh, karate practitioner uh, out of the UK. Uh, he's got one of the all time best accents in the entire world. He's it's phenomenal. You could just hear him speak forever. Uh, but what he did with solo kata and karate, which again is one of those things, that's his, um, you know, like that's his Yoko Minuchi Shihunagi, right? Like kata, what good is that? That's never going to work. That's never going to function. But what he does is he has this four tier process of how you, you cr- create functionality in your martial art. And so mm-hmm. his step one is you, you do the solo practice, the kata. Now for us, that could be weapons kata. That could be Aiki Taiso's. Um, I would even lump in our partnered kata. Absolutely. And I, I would put that in. He means solo. I would lump our, our partnered stuff into that. The most basic stuff you do with like a raw beginner. Like exactly. Very it, sterile uh, contact, but, but predictable, slow. It is a blueprint. You are setting this person up for success. There should, failure should be because um, you're failing, not because your UK is, mm-hmm. is, is making you fail. So that's level one. Level two is still in this cooperative environment, but it's an exploration of the principles that exist in that original template and the variations that exist in the original template. You know, I can think of, a, of an example of level one from the animal world. If Go you watch a, yeah. a cat wrestle with their kittens or, yeah. or a do- an adult dog like play, play with their puppy, they'll yeah. roll over like they got thrown by the puppy. You yes. know that that... that adult dog is not going to get thrown over submitted by their their pup but they're right. teaching it they're teaching that that young animal how it works well you're setting up uh, some parameters for success this is what you're trying to do you want to get me rolled over son you know like you're yeah. exactly right like it's a blueprint it's a template mm-hmm. just for what we're looking to do right mm-hmm. uh, so then again his his level 2 is uh expound on the principles and look at uh, variations. So for us, let's say we took um, a Sankyo, like you made that example earlier. That's a great example. Mm-hmm. But we have the template, like so for us, that could be um, holding holding it up and cutting. And then we start looking at the variations. We could do the old school Aikikai version. We could grab the, the lapel and do the choke like our style does. We could uh, do like a Steven Seagal release and, and turn it into a shihunai. So there's all these variations, but at, the, at this stage, there's still cooperation, right? Stage three is when you start to um, basically play with it a little bit more. You know, three and four, that's when you start to add uh, resistance a little okay. bit. And I think I'm massacring his, his, his order, but you can kind of see there's a very clear progression, right? It starts from a blueprint, and then it uh, moves on to uh, uh, exploration, and then it moves on to live training. So, and, w- and we can talk about a little bit more of that here. All right, so we have good conversations and we're not recording. So I'm gonna try to recapture some of that or, or, or kind of keep that thread going. When we finished off talking about Ian's um, process for taking something from kata to functionality. So I just wanted to give a example of how we've used his, his uh, process to help us. So let's take uh, Kubishimi, all right? We, you're, Uke chokes Nage. Nage has, you know, three or four things he could do. He could, you know, bring him over the shoulder. He could hinge around and take the person down. He could, uh, so this, whatever techniques you want to do. You run those for a while uh, with pretty much complete compliance. So, so the person can get the movements. After you've got the idea, what we do is we play a little game. So we'll go to... Uh, uh, a line in the dojo, and we'll say, okay, your job is to slap on the kubashimi 
and pull your uke across this line. That's your job. That's you pulling somebody out of their car. That's you pulling them into a van. That's you pulling them out of a of their home. Nage, your job is not to let that happen, right? You have these tools available to you, okay? I say go or I'll clap and then boom, there goes the choke, there goes the pull, and then we see people working their, their way through the problem. And what you will see is the solutions that you taught will come out. They're ugly as sin. They're, they're very disgusting to look at, but you can see the combative principles being utilized. So we try to run all of our things through that process. But they work. It's not about whether they're pretty. It's whether yeah. they function. But here's the thing. Sometimes they don't, and that's kind of important too, right? It is. Yeah. Because then you can hit the rewind button and go like, I didn't see you hinging. I didn't see you dropping your weight. I didn't see, you know, um, you don't say it. That way. You, don't, you don't tell somebody who just got pulled across the line like, well, you're dead and it's all your fault. What you do is you go like, okay, let's try that again. This time I want you to make sure you drop that weight, glue those elbows to your ribs. You know, sometimes you have to go, okay, that was great. Dial it back just a bit, right? Let's give them a little bit more breathing room. You're, you're still pulling, but give them a little bit more room to, to work. And so with that, you can change the variables so that you go from having a very classical Ushiro Kubashimi into a, a functioning drill. And we got all that from Ian, Ian's process. Yep. You know, one of the things that uh, I, I saw, I read a study on many years ago, and that was, and it was a study on mice. And it was kind of like we talked about the dogs and the cats that would teach their young. Mice will teach young mice how to wrestle. And what will happen is if the adult mouse doesn't let the, the young mouse win around 80% of the time, like it's 50% or they just annihilate the young mouse, the young mouse will just stop. They won't even do it anymore. They'll just quit. So there, there's that point. And I, and I always equated this to what is this being a good uke? Like if you want to be really specific, find where Nage needs you to be for the, about that 80% success rate. Give them their 20% of failure because that shows them what they're doing wrong. But the bulk of their work should be showing them what they're doing right. Yeah. If, they're, if they're so far off base, then you got to back down to the intensity level that will give, give them those successes. That's what yeah. a student really needs. Absolutely. And that's the, that is the value of having a, a, a tiered process where there is a space when you will succeed when you get it right. Like mm -hmm. I, as the UK, am not interfering with it. Like you might not know how to move your hands and your feet, but when you do figure that out, you will be successful. Yeah. And then stepping it up to a space where I am now going to try to prevent that. Mm -hmm. The mistake I see happen sometimes uh, is they take that resistance process and they put it on the blueprint face. Right. And like the mice that quit, it has been my experience that the students quit too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, this yep. is not fun. Like, this yeah, is you get demoralized and you have no idea what you should be doing and, and you're yeah. overwhelmed. Yeah. yeah. And then, and here's my favorite. Here's my, here's my personal favorite training method. Uh, resist the blueprint phase with all of your mind. Mm -hmm. Then spend 15 or 20 minutes tweaking every pinky and, and pinky toe and nose to get aligned and then all of a sudden your uke just falls to the ground like you just magically because you did it so perfectly like i told you right now right. it's working i'm like no come on dude like there's a lot of ways to prevent this and there's a lot of ways to succeed at it, you know um so that's why i think it's so important to have a blueprint phase where everything's going the best it can you have to have that phase yeah and the other thing i think <laughs> of a good uke is being able to spot even within like let's say uh, I'm a brand new person and you're guiding me through something you spot when I start getting comfortable with the lesson that we're yes. having. And yes. then you say, okay, you don't even tell me, you just start adding a little bit more variable, a little bit more resistance. And you kind of guide me along. Doesn't even have to be something where you announce it or say, here's what's going to happen. It's just, you, you, you start, you guide me by being your UK and or being a good uke and making it challenging enough for me so that i don't get bored that's the other part about that 80 percent if you have a 90 to 95 100 percent success rate the students get bored mm -hmm. there's they're winning they're doing they're winning everything they're getting yeah. trophies <laughs> yeah. um and that's that's not 
the most productive part of that curve. So, well, and, and again, if you have a system in place where you go template exploration, um, pressure test, if you want to use that term, I've taken people fresh, like they, this is day one. Right. And we'll work something like, okay, okay. going to put the hand on the shoulder. You're going to trap that hand. You're going to grab the head. You're going to turn and bring him to the ground and we're going to do it static. All right. Stage two, I'm going to push and I'm going to give you momentum and you have to ride that momentum down. By the end of an hour and a half, we could do G wazes and have two or three people come at them and say, you're only doing what you've been doing the whole time. The only difference is there's, there's multiple people coming or they're, they are going to push you. They are going to move you if they, and they can do it. They can do it in an hour and a half. You know, so, I've found this, the very same thing. A lot of times, you know, in, in, seeing how a lot of dojos and Aikido people are used to training and they'll go, well, Giawaza, that's something for like brown belts, black belts. Um, I've found the reverse is true. Just like you have, mm -hmm. I can take a, a brand new student that's in my dojo for less than a week and get them used to active, oncoming, adaptive work through the, the same exact process that you yeah. have. It's and they like it. it. That's the thing is they like it. They never build up a fear of, oh my God, what's this Giawaza or Randori yeah. thing? It's got to be scary. I've been training for two, three years and, and I'm not ready for it. Yeah. You know, you, you don't want to create that barrier in their mind. It, it's not going to look like if you were doing it, right? Right. And that's fine. It, but they are, because you know, at the end of the day, and I wish more Akita people got this. No, it should not matter what you can do. It should matter what you can get your student to do. Right. That's true. And I was about to say nobody cares what you can do, but that's not true. That nobody what? That nobody cares what you can do, but that's not right. true. Unfortunately, right. a lot of people go their entire careers on their instructor's achievements. They very much care what you can do, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But it shouldn't be that way. You know, it should be that this guy was able to get me moving in a way I didn't know I could mm -hmm. in an hour and a half. You know, Tohei was teaching police in six months, mm -hmm. you know? So like this idea of, takes 10 years or 20 years like that's a bad system guys like that's not good agreed yeah so you know what? it always struck me too that it once you become ranked enough or experienced enough to be an instructor you the quality of your art is measured and reflected in your students if you, oh, yes. you should invest Absolutely. in your students to the point where they show how how competent and capable your art is and if you're a good teacher you can replicate your skill in other people I've seen a lot of instructors that are great martial artists themselves. They can't teach and their students do not reflect their ability. Yeah. And for me as a teacher, I want every one of my students and I tell them this all the time. I want your Aikido to be better than mine. I want to learn from you and I won't rest until your Aikido is at least as good, if not better than mine so that we can train together. So yeah, it's supposed to be better, right. It's supposed to be better. Yeah. yeah. So I think one of the things we were talking about in the, in the break that I, I, I think, people would probably like to, to hear is uh, we're talking about our inspiration outside of Aikido, you know, uh, as, as we look at, look at other arts. And so uh, you, you had a great insight. And so when you look outside of Aikido for things that can make Aikido stronger, like wh where are you, where are you poking your head? Where are you investigating? Um, the, the exposures that I've found that I really like, and, and this has been since we started is I really like Savat for the, the street, style kicking i like wrestling for not only the stand-up uh and the grappling or the ground grappling also uh pigmaccia which is ancient greek boxing and pancration for the standing pins i like being able to pin somebody in the ground when i'm still on my feet and these are echoed in a lot of the old daito aiki jiu-jitsu standing pins but that approach i think is solid much more than being on the ground with someone so have you been and, able to integrate some of those ideas like your yes. savaha and your Yep, recipe. absolutely. And as and well as entries from pugilism, which uh, when you think of pugilism, a lot of times people think of like 18th century boxing, which it was, but it's not just, you know, this kind of this kind of boxing from here. It's being able to enter covered up and strike while you're covering your head. So when yeah. you need to solve the problem of how do I get from distance to close on somebody without getting hit, to me, those are the easiest, safest, most reliable, especially when there's multiple people there. Because it's yeah. one thing to, to deal with one person's punches. When you're dealing with several or flying objects, now you got to cover your head from stuff that you can't see. And, yeah. and to me, that style is, is probably the best. Um, 
and easiest to teach. I can get I can get students in two weeks to learn great head covers and feel comfortable and safe behind them, and to uh, to to close distance against a scary puncher with confidence. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, you know, at our academy we teach um, Aikido against my baby. Uh, we teach karate. Uh, again, influenced by Ian Abernathy, the practical karate, and we teach uh, JKD and Filipino martial arts. And sometimes the real challenge behind that is making them distinct enough because it's like you said, covering, that's not a karate thing. That's not a boxing thing. That's like a human. That's topology. Flying at my head. What do I do? How do I solve that? Mm -hmm. And so there is a area front loaded when probably most of these systems, if you're teaching them, combatively are going to look identical mm-hmm. and then after that you maybe can start investigating things that are different but like yeah. when you're when you're doing this mm-hmm. i mean it looks just like like panatukin or pikiti tertia or boxing or if i just threw a ball at somebody and they they went like right. that it you know it's all and i mean there's stuff. documentation back in europe back into the middle ages of using that those types of covers and entries and crashing and 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 things like that it's combat that's pure and simple yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I tell you, if people are interested in the idea of, of integrating other arts into their IQ, specifically into their IQ, well, don't get me wrong. If you just want to go and train because you love it, do that. You should, you should absolutely do that. But if the goal is bringing things back to your Aikido, I highly recommend looking for drills from arts that you see. Because what you'll find is uh, like the arm drag drill or something like that. You want to find things that you can do repetitively that are a little bit different than your normal Aikido training, but maintain the Aikido paradigm. Four. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, like arm drag drills are great. I, I like who, I know some people don't care for who, but uh, against a Filipino, like trapping drill. I get it. Some people don't like, it. I like it. I think, I think it's fun. And uh, the way we'll do it sometimes is um so you know you're doing your double hand parry drill or you know you're coming from above and moving it and it'll be like okay at some point in there while you're moving person a do an aikido technique mm-hmm. then person it'll be person b's turn it just gives it a little bit different format than just saying here's my wrist grab here's my technique mm-hmm. i'm not saying it's sparring i'm not saying it's fighting but it's another framework that you can train your aikido from so i really recommend people you know uh, like your covering drill that's an excellent drill if you want to learn how to do uh, like an arimi nage do it from people trying to throw jabs and crosses at you while you're covering and then wait for the, the right time to to enter you know? and what i've found is as i close in once i come up like this and i wind up and i unwind the hand goes right to the elbow as i do as sosa talked about there's my 90 percent. i want to get behind him if yep. i include that element I am right in a spot to do a great Dereminage. I got in covered, protected my head, got connection, basically did an arm drag in there. Now my hips are right behind his, and then zoom, I do a turn, and it's away we go. And you really nailed it right there, is you are intentional about what the goal of the drill is, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, and, and it, so like at our academy, I've never done that particular drill, what you just did, but here's how I would do it. Mm-hmm. I would teach a very classical Aikido technique. Mm-hmm. Katsutori Hontai or Riminage, something like that. Then I'd go do what you just did, covering drill. All right, we're going to spend the next five minutes in rounds. I'd get my timer. I learned that from Guru Dan Asano. Use a timer, not repetitions. You have Because one person's rep is not the same as another person's rep. Okay. So by keeping count, is it's not helpful. But if you go, like, for the next three minutes, person A is going to be throwing jabs and crosses. Person B is going to be covering. That's all. All right. Next phase, not only are you going to cover, you're going to unwind, trap that hand, and get into position. You don't even have to throw. Just get into position. And you just stair-step it mm-hmm. like that. And by the end of the night, people are doing a riminage off of jabs and crosses, you know. And, and you get students who say, I don't care what's being thrown at me. I don't have to identify the exact punch. I'm covered. I can get in. I know when my opportunity is there or not. Mm-hmm. And if it's not, I get out or I get into that flank position and I got something else I can do. And, and that's a wonderful way to teach that too, Tristan. What you just said is, is you teach um, jabs and crosses your first round and you teach hooks the next round. Mm-hmm. You, and you have a solution for A, a solution for B. And at the end of the night, yeah. the student is, is identifying in real time what the appropriate 
Yeah. Solution is to the problem. You know, it, it can be done. It can yeah. absolutely. Be Even done. the flailing punches, which you see in a lot of videos of, of real okay. fights, is people just their arms are flailing away. That can be one of the scariest things. Somebody's running at you with their arms flailing, and you're like, yeah. something could hit me. But yeah. when you get that cover up and you realize, I can do this. Yeah, this is doable. I'm gonna I'm gonna plow over them because yeah. once you and then the other great thing about this is once you're okay and you are that flailing idiot, mm -hmm. you know the aggressor and you realize what being snow plowed with a couple of elbows coming in the middle, you realize I got power against what that person's doing. Absolutely. Even though they've got chaos flying at me, I'm covered, I'm safe, and I'm gonna run them over. Like, yeah, it's a psychological component. Yeah, the, the confidence right? part that's built in there. And like I said, I've done this with people, students that have been with, with me for less than a month. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not worried about somebody taking a haymaker swing at me or coming barreling at me with their fists flying. Like, I know what to do with that. Yeah. You know, of course, the same principle, get off the line, cover up, and move in. You know, Irimi is, is you got to take control of that. Um, I will say, I think if, if I've had any success at making things that don't look like Aikido, Aikido, because I am not the genius that Sosa Sensei was. I, I, I don't have that ability just to, to, to meld it the way he did. But if I've had any success, it's this. I start with the classical Aikido technique, mm -hmm. and then we – expand into the things that don't look classical but make sure we're still identifying it did you see how we still got behind them did you still see how we controlled the limb did you still see how we took the balance the kazushi mm -hmm. so if you speak aikido it's so much better than just going like in an aikido class mm -hmm. uh, this is what we're going to do today we're just going to cover up and if you if you start like going well here's unbendable arm right well what's the difference between unbendable arm and this my eye it's it. It's the only difference. The, 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 the formation is the same. Right. You can talk Aikido people through the process of opening, opening their mind. But if you just go like, I'm wearing a hakama and a gi, and now I'm going to start doing boxing, they will tune you out. They will exactly. not listen to you. Yep. They, will, they will say that that's not Aikido. But if you show the classical, I think Bruce Bookman is so good at this. He's mm -hmm. so good at this. He does the classical movement. And then he shows it from like a boxing perspective. And then he shows it from a BJJ perspective. But you see this thread going all the way through. Uh, again, Ian, you know, Ian is so good at this because he does all the application stuff. And it just looks like he's mauling a human. You know, like when you see him with a person so fast, so focused on what he's doing. Then he goes back and he shows the cut apart. And you're like, I get it. I see it. I see it there. There's a thread all the way through versus saying like, that's not kata. That's not what you're doing. It's absolutely what you're doing, but you got to walk people. You got to, you know, that's stay. the, that's the thing that, that uh, a good teacher does is he builds a bridge between the student's understanding and the teacher's understanding. And the student may say, look at all this water between it. I don't even, I don't even know how you could get from point A to point B, but a teacher says, all right, let me build the bridge that will get you there. That will yeah. get you to understand from where you are to where, what I want you to see. And a lot of teach, a lot of instructors, unfortunately, are poor teachers, and they don't they don't comprehend that that's the goal. Yeah. They kind of say, "My goal is to show how awesome I am, yeah. and that you should be like me," or or something similar yeah. to that. You know, but, got a lot of that. To your point, that might be the goal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you have to find a teacher who has goals that align with yours. You know? Oh, absolutely. Is there all kinds all kinds out there for sure? Especially when you look at Aikido, you know. Mm -hmm. I have, I have zero problem with the more artistic expressions of Aikido. Zero. In fact, I kind of like to see it sometimes. Mm -hmm. You, it's only when you say that this solves this problem mm -hmm. that you get into trouble if what you're doing doesn't solve that problem, right? But if the problem is I just want to find a way to move and express myself, connect to this culture, like, that's fine. That is a valid solution, you know? You know, I, it, and very like, like a manner, I never had any objection to Taibo, but it wasn't yeah. kickboxing. Yeah. They yeah. never tried to say, you're going to become a, a champion kickboxer by right. doing Taibo. You get in shape, you'll sweat, you'll, you know, your body it's, will improve. It's a fun way to, to right. do this thing, yeah. But we're not getting in boxing gloves. We're not putting on boxing trunks and boxing shoes and pretending to be boxers. Mm -hmm. it, it, there was an honesty, at least, to what the program was. And as, yeah. and as long as that's there, I think you can do whatever yeah. kind of, you know, I would agree. you yeah. want, you know.
and I'd probably hang out with you and do it too, right? You know, you that, <laughs> yeah. This is what we're gonna, you know, that's fun too. Just going, hey, we're just gonna riff, like. Sure. And I do have that. a, I do have a good time doing doing the flow practices yeah. and the, the stuff, and I'll even do them with my students and just say, just to let you know, this is fun as hell. You know, I was shown this, you know, with my aikido and training. Yeah. I'd never do this if somebody was actually attacking me. Like this is not practical. Yeah. Um. But you know, there's a place for it. Absolutely. In my opinion, it's it's just taking stock of within your training, if you consider that 100%, where do you adjust the percentages of, of where you're putting your training? Because you sure. can't put 100% of everything in, in, and leave out a whole bunch of different things. It's just a lot, getting with an instructor or being a practitioner that says, I want to adjust my training for the needs that I want to have. And that'll Absolutely. include, you know, a certain percentage of, you know, Randori live type, type training, uh, some stress inoculation training, which is a lot of times part of that too, uh, as well as the, the kata. And, and I do admire the technical precision that you get at that level one and two. That's an important part. You can't just go rock and roll 100% or 80% of the time. Right. In fact, modern trainers are finding that the flow drills in the middle are the most productive. Yes. The high-end stuff should be done sparingly. Uh, but you really get the most effect out of the creative but slower uh, type drilling, the live drilling at a lower, slightly lower intensity level. My suspicion is the reason people are so resistant to add that type of training um, to their curriculum is because when you hear against a resisting opponent, what immediately comes to mind is full blown out sparring. Right. And, and if you think that, then you're, you are right. Like that's not probably going to help your Aikido mm -hmm. in, a, in a productive way right but if you look at like really uh guru dan tells a story often he said uh when he and his wife went to thailand to do thai boxing you know him and his wife were just you know smashing elbows and they were kneeing each other and, and the professional fighters were going like why are you guys going so hard <laughs> like it's just training you know i've heard that many times yeah. like these guys have to fight every week like yeah. so it's not going to help you if you're injured or uh, you only know one thing because when you're under or pressure. Or even exhausted. You can exhaust yourself yeah. in 15 minutes and you're toast. Yeah. The Russians are finding if you go 60 somewhere between 40 and 60%, you mm -hmm. can train for six, eight hours. Yeah. Now imagine somebody that, you know, you face, you've done a month of 15 minutes every three days and they've been doing six hours, mm -hmm. six, seven days a week. Who's going to be at the advantage? Yeah. Who's going to be an advantage if one of you's fresh and one of you's got an ACL that's blown out? Right. You, you one know. of you's going to have a, a, one of those is going to have a ton more experience. Yeah. You know, and and be a lot better trained and and have those movements just ingrained deeply in their body. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's a big advantage. Which helped me when I understood that you can progressively add the resistance and progressively add the unpredictability, and it's not it's not just you're either, this is the way it was when we were coming up, probably, probably you too. Mm -hmm. You do the kata or the waza, mm -hmm. and then you do rondori. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Like, that's all right. there is. You know, there was, no, there was never, like, any intermediary steps. And once we started adding the intermediary steps, I think our Aikido has started doing this. I so. think, and that's consistent. I remember the, every, and I would, everywhere I'd travel, I'd try to visit dojos. Uh, I would go out, way out of my way to attend seminars as much as I could. And I remember asking around, especially to black belts and seniors, like, tell me about your randori. Tell me about how you train at it or how you succeed at it. And most people are like, they got real sheepish about, well, I, you know, they didn't have an answer. And I think, I think the answer is if you take the approach like that, which is you're either doing kata or it's full on rock and roll randori time, people are not going to want to do randori. They're not prepared for it. Yeah. It'd be like playing in a kiddie pool in your backyard and then throwing somebody in the ocean and say, here, go swim for five miles. Like, You've been swimming. It'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I, I think that there are very few places that will take those intermediary steps. And I, I had the same thing when I, uh, under, under Phil, my instructor, um, he, he allowed me to bring in my experience from my combat sports that dealt with multiple opponents and say, let's, let's bring this in and, and train people how to do it. I'm like, all right, well, I'll give it a shot, you know? Yeah. And that was, what, 14 years ago, 13 years ago now, somewhere like that. 
And what I found was if you teach principles, you don't have to start with brown or black belt students. You can sure. start with people right off the, if it's clear, say, here's what I want you to do. That person comes after you, you stay going forward and get off the line. That's all you have to do. Mm -hmm. If you can break these down into simple principles, they can apply it before they ever get scared of it, before the, it ever becomes a fearful thing and get, get them through that progression. And, um, you know, I've, I've had great success with it and have, you know, white belts. And so when are we going to do Randori again? That was, that was fantastic, you know, um, including the stress inoculation of having people come sprinting at them. You know, that's one of the scariest things you'll see is somebody come sprinting at you to attack you yeah, absolutely. and get them used to it. Say, so here's, in fact, it's easier to deal with because they can't turn. You know, they're committed to that line. And when you get off the line, they'll often overshoot you because they can't swerve. If you time it right, they can't cut to, to track you. So. And then I'm sure you give them the, the um, opportunity to time it right. Yes. You, know, you can't say it. Like, just don't. If you're perfect, your Aikido will, yep. will save you. No, you got to give them the opportunity to experience yep. it. So. And experience different timing, different approach speeds that adjust when you have to move. you got to be, be able to see and adjust at the right time based on the speed that's coming in. So a um, lot of great stuff. I think, Alvar, I think we could just chat all day, but uh, I should we, probably – probably wrap this up and we'll we, I think we, we should do this again because I've just had a great time well I always have a good time talking to you and uh, I just think you've done an awesome job both with the podcast and you're pretty much the only forum I participate in online it's the only Aikido for uh for those that everyone knows because that's how you, you know Tristan the uh, Aikido Marshall side fantastic uh forum really good stuff on that it's the only one I I play ball in so you know, I've heard a couple of people say that recently too, is, is, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad I could not be happier with the mature conversations that happen on there. For the most part, there's a, only yeah. a couple of, you know, sure. errant comments, but for the most part, people bring up great topics. We've got a lot of experienced people that, that get in some great discussions. Uh, I've learned a ton about Aikido just from the wisdom that's shared from other people there. And, uh, and it, so I'm, I'm really happy We're, the site's growing. Um, I think we got 11,500 people now. Fantastic. That's which awesome. Is, which is really cool. Um, and and I try, we try to keep the spam and the off-topic stuff out so that if you do want to go back and look at things, you can scroll and you don't have to scroll by all kinds of just junk. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you came, came upon the, the forum and, and we've had some great discussions on there too. So um, I guess if there's anything you want to wrap up with, I'll give you the last right. word. Just thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I hope we can do this again because, like I said, you know, we're, we're geeks and we could just do this all the time, all day long. So uh, look forward to the next time we get to speak, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you, Oliver, uh, for joining us. And I guess we'll wrap up the, the podcast with this. So have a good day, everybody. Have a good one, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as we did. Please help by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast if you're watching this on YouTube or BitChute. These are all free and help out a great deal. Word of mouth is how shows like this reach more people who are interested. Also, please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube, or go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall side and post a comment. I'd particularly like to hear from those who met, trained with, or learned from Bill Sosa. A great deal of the content I share in the Spirit Aikido online program are influences from other arts which I've woven into my Aikido. I've just uploaded the 100th video, which is a milestone for the program, and I continue to add new videos every few days. In the most recent series of videos, I cover some techniques and drills for training against an ambush, as well as expand on my series in the use of the cane for self-defense. There's a link in the description section. I invite you to check it out. I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.